Let's go. We're going to continue on here. Tony Robbins, Money Master of the Game. Probably a little less babbling today. I've got to work in a little while. So this will be chapter 6.9. Kyle Bass, the Master of Risk. Founder, Heyman Capital Management. As a competitive diver, Kyle Bass understands the basic law of physics. He knows well that what goes up must come down. That's why in 2005 he began to ask questions about the booming U.S. housing market. Questions no one else thought to ask, like, what happens if housing pri house what happens if housing prices don't keep going up forever? Those questions led to him led him to make one of the biggest bets in the world on the impending housing crash of 2008 and the economic meltdown that followed. Bass would go on to make a 600% return on his money in just 18 months and secure his place as one of the brightest, most thoughtful hedge fund managers of his time. Kyle does very few interviews, but it turned out my work had inspired him while he was still in college. So I had the privilege of flying out to Texas to sit down with him in his skyscraper building overlooking the great city of Dallas. Bass is one of the few financial powerhouses who views his distance from New York City as a competitive advantage. We don't get bogged down by the noise, he says. Bass is humble and approachable. When I asked him about that, when I asked him about the questioning that led him to the best to bet against the housing market, he replied, "Tony, this isn't rocket science. This is just some idiot from Dallas asking questions." Bass lives with his family and serves on the board of trustees of the U University of Texas Investment Management Company, helping to oversee one of the largest public endowments in the country, with over $26 billion in assets. You've already learned about Bass and his nickels. He's the guy who taught his children the lesson of asymmetric risk-slash-reward by buying up $2 million worth of nickels and earning a 25% return on day one of his investment. In fact, Bass says he'd put his entire net worth in nickels if he could find that many coins on the market to buy. Nickels aside, Bass's relentless focus on asymmetric risk slash reward has led to two of the biggest return bets of the century in both the housing market and the European debt crisis that began in 2008. He's got a third bet underway that says he's, it's, that he says is even bigger. What follows is an excerpt of our two and a half hour conversation in his downtown office. Obviously Tony Robbins will be TR and Kyle Bass will be KB. TR, tell me a little about a bit about yourself, KB. I was a springboard and platform diver, which people think is intensely physical, but it's 90% mental. It's basically you versus yourself. For me, it was very rewarding. It taught me how to be disciplined and how to learn from my failures. It's really how you, f how you deal with failure that defines you as a person. I have a loving mother and a loving father, but they never saved any money. I swore I would never be like that. My parents both smoked. I swore I would never smoke. For me, I have always been driven harder by the negative things in my life versus the positive. There are many congruencies in my life and your teachings. TR, absolutely. When I look at the common the one common denominator that makes somebody succeed Beyond education or talent, it's hunger. KB, hunger and pain. TR, the hunger comes from the pain. You don't get really hungry when it's been easy. KB, that's right. TR, so your hunger drove you to start your own fund. It was 2006, right? KB, correct. TR, the thing that's so amazing to me is the speed at which you started producing returns. KB, that was lucky. TR, you had 20% the first year and like 216% the next year, right? KB, that's right. It was just fortuitous that early on 
I saw what was going on in the mortgage market. I believe in the saying, luck is where your preparation meets opportunity. <clears throat> I think I might have read that in one of your books when I was in college. Well, I was prepared. I like to think that I was lucky and in the right place at the right time because I had all my resources dedicated to that in the moment. TR. A lot of people knew about the housing problem and didn't act on it. What was different about you? What really made you succeed in that area? KB. If you remember back then, money was basically free. In 2005 and six, you could get a Libor plus 250 term loan. You know, I say Libor like as if it's something French. I don't know how you pronounce it, L-I-B-O-R, um, but I like saying Libor, so, so we're gonna roll with it. You could get a Libor plus 250 term loan, meaning a very cheap loan, and you and I could go buy a company we wanted with a little bit of equity and a ton of debt. I was on the phone with my friend and colleague Alan Fournier at the time, and we were trying to figure out how not to lose betting against housing. And the pundits kept saying, housing is a product of job growth and income growth. So as long as you had income growth and job growth, home prices would keep going up. That of course was flawed thinking. TR, yes, as we all found out. KB. I had a meeting at the Federal Reserve in September 20, 2006, and they said, look, Kyle, you're new to this. You have to realize that income growth drives housing. And I said, but wait, housing has moved in perfect tandem with median income for 50 years. But in the last four years, housing has gone up 8%, and incomes have moved only 1.5%. So, were five or six standard deviations from the mean. To bring those relationships back in line again, incomes would have to go up almost 35% or housing had to drop 30%. So I called around all the desks on Wall Street and said, I want to see your model. Show me what happens if home prices go up only 4% a year, 2% a year, or 0%. There wasn't one Wall Street firm, not one in June 2006, that had a model that contemplated housing being flat. Right back. TR, are you serious? KB, not one. TR, these guys just drank their own Kool-Aid. KB, so in November of 2006, I asked UBS to put forth a model that had flat home prices, and their model said that losses to the mortgage pool would be 9%. A mortgage pool is a group of mortgages with similar maturities and interest rates that were lumped together into a single package or security called a mortgage-backed security. These securities were assigned a high credit rating and then sold to investors for an expected return. Assuming housing prices continued to go up, the pool would deliver high returns. But if home prices didn't go up, if they just sat still, these things were going to lose 9%. I called Alan Fournier of Pennant Capital Management. He formerly worked for David Tepper's Appaloosa Management, and I said, this is it. And when I formed the general partner of my subprime funds, I named it AFGP after Alan Fournier because, because of the phone call we had. Because, of, because for me, that phone call flipped a switch. TR, wow. And you can tell me what the risk reward ratio of the bet for you and Alan was? KB, basically, I could bet against housing and only pay 3% a year. If I bet a dollar and home prices went up, all I could lose was 3 cents. TR, amazing. So the risk, the price to bet against housing was totally out of whack. KB, yep. It only cost me 3%. <clears throat> TR. Because everyone thought the market would go up forever and the upside. KB. If housing stayed flat or went down, I'd make the whole dollar. TR. So 3% downside if you were wrong, 100% upside if you were right. 
KB. Yes. And it's a good thing I didn't listen to every mortgage expert I met with. They all said, Kyle, you have no idea what you're talking about. This isn't your market. This can't happen. I said, okay, well, that's not a good enough reason for me because I've done a lot of work on this and I may not understand everything you understand, but I could see the forest for the trees. And the people that live in the market, all they could see were the trees. TR, you understood the core of risk slash reward. KB, I also heard this a lot. Well, that can't happen because the whole financial system would crash. That still wasn't good enough for me either. That bias, the positive bias that we all have is built in. It's an innate and hu it's innate in human nature. You wouldn't get out of your bed if you were positive about your life, right? It's a bias we have as humans to be optimistic. If you weren't positive about your life, sorry. TR it works for us everywhere, but in the financial world. KB, that's exactly right. TR, what's even more amazing is that after calling the housing burst, you were also right about Europe and Greece. How did you do that? Again, I'm trying to understand the psychology of how you think. KB, in mid-2008, post Bear Stearns, right before Lehman went bankrupt, we sat in here with a team and said, okay, what's going on throughout the crisis is that the risk in the world that used to be on a private balance sheet is moving to the public balance sheets. So let's get a whiteboard and let's reconstruct the public government balance sheets of the nations. Let's look at Europe, Japan, let's look at the United States. Let's look everywhere there's a lot of debt. And let's try to understand. So I thought, if I'm Ben Bernanke, Bern Bernanke head of Fed at the time, or... Jean-Claude Trickett, president of European Central Bank, and I want to get my arms around this problem, what do I do? How do I do it? Well, here's what I do. I'd look at my own balance sheet debts as a country, and then I need to know how big my banking system is in relation to two things, my GDP and to my government re revenue. TR makes sense, KB. So we basically looked at a bunch of different countries and asked, how big is the banking system? How many loans are out there? Then we tried to figure out how many of them were going to go bad, and then back solve for how, ha how bad it was going to be for us as a country. So I told my team to go call some firms and find out how big those countries' banking systems were. Guess how many firms had a handle on that mid-2008? TR, how many? KB, zero. Not one. And we called everybody. <coughs> TR, wow. KB. So I dug into the white papers on sovereign debt and read them all. They are mostly focused on emerging economies because historically it was emerging nations that restructured their sovereign balance sheets. TR, developed nations only reconstruct post war. KB, right. Two countries spend a fortune to go to war. They run up debts, and to the victor go the spoils, and to the loser went defeat every time. That's how the world works. In this case, it was the largest accumulation of debt in peacetime and world history. TR. Amazing. KB. So how big is the banking system? We went out there and gathered the data and used two denominators. GDP and central government tax revenue. And this was a huge learning process because we had never done it before. TR, it sounds like nobody else had. KB, this isn't rocket science, Tony. This is some idiot in Dallas saying, how do I get my arms around the problem? And so we did the work. And I came up with the charts and I said, rank them worst to best. Who was the single worst entry on the sheet? TR, Iceland? KB, right, Iceland went first. Who went next? It wasn't rocket science. TR, Greece? Kyle nods, yes. TR, wow, KB. So, we did all this work, and I looked at the, <clears throat> at the an analysis, and I said, this can't be right. I was being hyperbolic to my team. I was saying, if this is right, you know what's going to happen next. TR, correct, KB. 
So when I asked, where are the insurance contracts trading on Iceland and Greece? And my team said, Greece is 11 basis points. 11 basis points? That's 11 hundred and tenths of 1%. And I said, well, we need to go buy a billion of that one. TR, wow, that's incredible. KB, mind you, this is third quarter 2008. TR, the writing was on the wall at that stage. KB, I called Professor Kenneth Rogoff at universe, Harvard University, who didn't know me from Adam, and I said, I've spent several months constructing a world balance sheet and trying to understand this. I said, the results of our construct, they're too negative for me. I literally said, I think I must be misinterpreting these. Could I come sit down with you and share with you the results of my work? And he said, by all means. TR, that's great. KB. So I spent two and a half hours with him in February of 2009, and I'll never forget. He got to the summary page with a chart of all the data, and he sat back in his chair, put his glasses up, and said, Kyle, I can hardly believe it's this bad. And I'm immediately thinking, oh shit. All of my fears are being confirmed by the father of sovereign balance sheet analysis. So, if he wasn't thinking about it, do you think Bernick and Trick it were? No one was thinking about this. There was no cohesive plan. TR, none. KB, he was dealing with curveballs as they were being thrown. TR, that's just unbelievable. So I have to ask about Japan because I know that's what you're focused on now. KB. Right now, the biggest opportunity in the world is in Japan, and it's way better than subprime was. The timing is less certain, but the payoff is multiples of what the subprime market was. I believe the world's stress point is Japan, and it's about to be the cheapest it's ever been right now, meaning to buy a kind of insurance policy. TR. Yes, and what is it costing you? KB. Well, the two things to take into account for the option pricing model are, one, the risk-free rate, and two, volatility of the underlying asset. So imagine if the turkey used this theory, <clears throat> if he were gauging his risk of being killed based upon historical volatility of his life, it would be zero risk. TR, right. KB, until Thanksgiving Day. TR, until it's too late. KB, when you think about Japan, there's been 10 years of suppressed prices and subdued volatility. The volatility is mid-single digits. It's as low as any asset class in the world. The risk-free rate is one-tenth of 1%. So when you ask the price on an option, the formula basically tells you it should be free. TR, right. KB, so if the Japanese bonds moved up 150 basis points to 200 basis points, 1.5 to 2 percent it's over the whole system detonates in my opinion tr wow kb but my theory is i have always said to our investors if it moves 200 basis points it's going to move 1500 tr right kb it's neither going to sit still and do not it's either going to sit still and do nothing or it's going to blow apart tr this always plays into your idea of tail risk Tell me what tail risk is, not many investors focus on it. KB. If you look at what I'm doing, I'm spending three or four basis points a year on Japan. That's four hundredths of a percent, okay? If I'm right about the binary nature of the potential outcome of the situation there, these bonds are going to trade at 20% yields or higher. So, I'm paying four tenths of one percent for an option that could be worth 2,000%. Tony, there has never been a more mispriced option that exists in the world's history. Now, that's my opinion. I could be wrong. So far, I am, by the way. TR, you're, the wrong, <clears throat> you're wrong on timing. KB, I'll tell you what. I could be wrong for 10 years, and if I'm right 10 years from now, it was still 100% odds on that to be there before it happened. And people say to me, how could you bet on that? because it's never happened before. And I say, well, how can you be a prudent fiduciary if I give you the scenario I just laid out and not do this? Forget whether you think I'm right or wrong. When I show you the cost to do that, if your home, make sure.
How do you not do that? If your home is in the area that is prone to fire, and 200 years ago there was a big fire that wiped everything out, how do you not pay for homeowner's insurance? TR. Got it. That's awesome. So let me ask you this. Do you consider yourself to be a significant risk taker? KB? No. TR. I didn't think so. That's why I asked. Why do you say you're not a risk taker? KB? Let me rephrase that. Significant risk taker means we can lose all of our money. I never set myself up for the knockout punch. TR. Tell me this. If you could not pass on any of your money to your children, but you could only pass on a portfolio and a set of rules, what would that look like for your kids? KB, I'd give them a couple hundred million dollars worth of nickels because then they wouldn't have to worry about anything. TR, they're done. Their investment portfolio is done. Oh my God, that's wild. What gives you the most joy in life? KB, I, love, I have my kids. TR, that's awesome. KB, 100%. TR, Kyle, thank you. I enjoyed this and I learned a lot. Uh, I got to be honest with you, um, there have been portions of this book in which I really, uh, I've enjoyed. This chapter, chapter 6.9, by far, Kyle Bass, my favorite, uh, you know, he talks about him early on in the book, you know, when he, when he tells the story of uh, the Nichols, but, um, but listening to him... Uh, or reading this conversation between them is just absolutely um, fascinating. And I've, of course, got to look up his birth chart because I am just interested now. Interesting. Uh, they don't really... So I'm going to have to just go Kyle Bass birthday because apparently Google wants to play with me. Wow. You know, it's fascinating. This was chapter 6.9. His birthday, September 7th, 1969. Um, Virgos. They, uh... They've got a way about them, for sure. Um, and I don't know his full breakdown. I don't know his chart. Uh, looks like he was born in Miami. Um, but but just going off of his sun sign and the fact that he's a Virgo, uh, I don't think I've met one Virgo that wasn't driven. Um, they can get in their own way sometimes. Um, I've seen Virgos that have literally, they just can't get out of their own way. And that's been the only reason why they haven't been able to succeed. But uh, but I, I get along quite well with Virgos. I like Virgos a lot, both male and female. So it doesn't surprise me one bit that Kyle Bass is a, uh, a Virgo. But like I said, this was by far my favorite chapter. Uh, mainly due to the fact that it was, even though this guy is like a you know, ridiculously wealthy individual and... Um, and on a obviously a completely different level than me, he's relatable, and it's so nice to have somebody that's relatable. You know, um, I really can appreciate that. And when he talks about the housing market, and when he talks about you know these things, um, it's appreciated. And saying it's not rocket science, I'm just this idiot from you know Texas or whatever. Um, I know he's you know somewhat joking, but. Uh, I appreciate that you know what I mean because he's breaking it down and saying look I'm just looking at what's obvious I'm looking at uh, that common sense <laughs> factor you know what I mean that so many people just don't seem to have anymore is common sense and he clearly does so that's about all I got I appreciate you watching until next time when we will continue on with uh, chapter 6.10 mark Faber so, uh, man, I'm, I'm excited, man. We, we are almost done with this book. So, see y'all next time. I am out.